It's the Cube, covering HPE Big Data Conference 2016. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Welcome back to the Boston Waterfront, everybody. This is the Cube Silicon Angles special presentation of Hewlett Packard Enterprises Big Data Conference. Hashtag is Seize the Data. Colin Mahoney is here. He's the Senior Vice President and General Manager of HPE's Big Data Division. Colin, great to see you again. Great to see you guys. Thank you for coming. So you are the man at this, yeah. this event. Uh, I see you've upgraded the outside speakers yet again, uh, which is Try fantastic. Try to do that every time. Yeah. Vertica 8, uh, big announcement this morning we yeah. were talking about. So yeah. how do you feel? Yeah, I feel great. You know, I actually, I, I said this this morning, but I think there's never been a better time to be involved with anything data. Um, I think over the first couple of years, I mean, you recall from the beginning of the show, uh, a lot of it was missionary work, trying to explain to people what big data was, what data was, how it could help. I think we're well into the zone of people understand how it can help. There's great examples, whether it's fighting cancer, making people healthier, fighting terrorism, uh, finding better customers, serving your customers better. There's just countless examples of what people have been doing. And what I love about this conference is we bring together the, the customers and partners who are just have been doing this for a long time. It's just great hearing their stories. I was telling Paul, the first big data conference, I was doing the Phil Donahue in the main tent, and one of the uh, audience members had a question, and they were kind of antagonistic about, when are we going to see big data applied to something besides ad tech? Yeah. And we're seeing it. Yeah. You gave a number of examples today. We are seeing it, and as, as sometimes annoying as those ad tech algorithms have been in our, in our lives as we're trying to surf the web and do other things, I think that they really paved the way for a lot of these other industries to not only have the right algorithms and be able to do the, those analytics, but also have the right talent pool who can come in and apply data in a very practical way to the industry. So I think, um, We've come a long way for sure, but we've learned a lot as well. You talked this morning about just collecting data and how the early days of this conference, it was focused on, people were focused mainly on just getting a hold of that data and storing it, and now you're talking about putting it to, to use. Where you find those breakthroughs are coming in, in customers' mindsets? What kind of, where are those aha moments that, that enlighten them to the potential of analytics? I think the aha moments that work the best for our customers are the ones where they don't try to boil the ocean, somebody just has a question or they have something that they want to test. Um, they throw out a hypothetical and then they find the data and they see from maybe not even a huge set of data, maybe it's just a subset of data, but they look historically at something and they're able to replay what happened and then very quickly prove that there's a, a positive return on understanding that data and I think when any organization starts with a project that might be small and they, they hit something like that, it just opens up every other sort of curious questioning that you could imagine. And then I think organizations themselves, the culture starts shifting where people believe in it and they buy into it and then you don't go into a meeting without being armed with a lot of data. But it oftentimes starts very small. It's just somebody had a hypothesis they go back, they look at the data, they see something that happened, and they realize, wow, um, that actually is hugely valuable to know so that we can do better this next time. So, so do you see this as more of a viral phenomenon where, where <coughs> big data or analytics awareness spreads from the bottom up? I think in many ways it does spread from the bottom up. But I would also say that you have to buy into it as an organization from the top down. I think the, the leaders of the organizations that are, are best with data, what they do is they, they describe the importance of the data, they describe the moonshot of the data, they embrace data as a catalyst, data as an accelerant, data as a disruptor, and even when the data is not saying great things, those leaders still embrace and want to hear about that data. And so I do think there is a virality to it from the bottom up, but I also think you have to get that support um, throughout the organization, especially from the top, to make it work. We were just at a conference in Cambridge. You mentioned Cambridge is sort of the center of the, the Vertica universe. A uh, conference in Cambridge last month about the Chief Data Officer Symposium. And uh, some 3,000 companies, according to Forrester, now have Chief Data Officers. Are you, are you talking increasingly to people with that title? 
We are. So I think um, in the early days where we saw chief data officers was in companies like gaming companies and, and other more startup organizations. I think as, as data has become a critical asset and frankly it can be a liability from a compliance standpoint, it's been really important for organizations to have a C-level executive who is the steward of data, the person whose only job is to make sure that on the one hand, it's being protected, it's being used and compliant with government and other agencies, and on the other hand, that it's being monetized. So many banks that we talk to all the time say, you know, we've been collecting data forever, um, we've basically been forced to collect it for compliance reasons, but now we actually think we can do a lot of great things with that information to give our customers a better experience or to reduce fees or to do this or do that. Uh, and oftentimes it's the chief data officer that is in conjunction with IT and the business sitting in between and making that happen. You've been involved in big data uh, before it was called big data. Yeah. Uh, we're the better part of a decade in. You had Phil Black, uh, former Navy SEAL, I guess once a Navy SEAL, always a Navy SEAL. Yeah, yeah. A Navy SEAL. Yeah, we won't take up, that away from Up on from stage them. today. Yep. Uh, and he, you know, he talked about ringing the bell. 80% of the, the candidates ring the bell. Uh, they give up and no, no, no shame in giving up that. But, uh, so not to be pejorative there. But the, the point is, uh, the question I have for you is, everybody talks about the data-driven organization. Yep. He gave this sort of great talk about being uncommon and having this uncommon grit and desire. Yep. So by definition, you know, 80% of the organizations out there are not the best at you know, being data-driven. Yeah, absolutely. Do Vertica customers, um, have you found a higher affinity for data-driven organizations because you were there early, um, you, you aligned with a lot of the analytics folks? Um, can you talk about that a little bit? And do you have any sort of evidence that some of the early Vertica adopters are leading that sort of big data driven organization? Yeah, so first of all, you know, I loved Phil's talk about grit because I think people are not born data scientists. Organizations are, are generally not born analytical. Even some of the new companies that are out there, some of our customers who seem like they're only about analytics, I don't think it happens overnight. I think it's something that you dedicate yourself to like anything else, you take risks, and you persevere through it. And whether you're an individual trying to become a data scientist or you're an organization trying to compete on analytics and data, I think that is probably the most important trait. We, of course, talk about technology and you know, we love our technology, we love our solutions, but at the end of the day, it comes down to these companies and, and the people, and I think to your question about you know, have we had maybe a disposition towards some of the more analytical mm -hmm. companies? I think in many ways, a lot of them found us in the early days because they were looking at such enormous challenges and just had to try something. But we also have a lot of customers that um, we've, we've gone on this journey with that I wouldn't say started as analytic companies at all and they have made amazing strides and progress in becoming analytic organizations. In fact, uh, we had our customer advisory council yesterday, and uh, one of the CIOs from the, this, uh, this customer, large private company, um, said that you know, hit, most of his journey has been convincing the other people in his company that they need to be data driven, you know, that they need to monitor their delivery trucks, even though everybody's saying, you know, why are you going to do that? You're being big brother. He had to build up the argument and then build in the, the capability, that muscle memory, to be analytical. And as, as uh, you know, Steve Spear talked about this morning as well, n everyone can be a knowledge worker. And I think you know, whether you're um, you know, on a blue collar job working on a line, you can be a great knowledge worker. And those organizations that build that into every part of the organization, take the feedback, monitor it, make the change and become better, they're the ones that are generating massive, massively more profit than maybe a company that looks the same in the same market. What, um, you talked this morning about, Vertica's always kind of been in between the traditional enterprise data warehouse and this whole open system you know, community that, that just exploded. Uh, um, and many, you said, were sort of pushing you guys toward getting deeper into that community, picking up companies or maybe yep. doing in, investing there and you resisted that. Why? Um, is it just a waiting game, you know, like Bubba Gump Shrimp? <laughs> or <laughs> or is it, was it something more fundamental th than that? Uh, and, and what does that all say for the future of, of Vertica? Yeah, I think so. I think it was simple and maybe more fundamental. I, for us, we just wanted to focus on what we did well. 
And I think from, from the days that Vertica started and well into us being part of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, having that focus and knowing what you do well is critically important to any execution you can do in any business. Um, also though, the, the wonderful renaissance, whether it was open source or non-open source technologies that were coming out in the analytic realm, there's just so many choices and it's hard to know which ones are going to pan out, which ones aren't. It seems like acronyms pop up every week and um, we wanted to embrace it and we wanted to extend it and make sure that our products work with the ecosystem, but we also wanted to make sure it was hardened and that it would fit into these deployments that we have. So. I think it was really just about focus and staying power and coming into our own and in, in a timing where the market is really now all about, okay, I've got the data, now what do I do with it? Um, I'm really glad that we stayed focused on that because I, I think it's paying off. So how would you summarize what you do really well and what gives you confidence that some open source project isn't going to you know, <laughs> disintermediate what that is? Well, I'm always paranoid, as somebody who's an entrepreneur, <laughs> um, I subscribe to the, you know, Andy Grove's Only the Paranoid Survive. I'm always thinking that somebody is going to come out there and they're going to disrupt the market. So what we balance, I think, really well is being open-minded to these, these ideas that could be disruptive technologies, staying very close to the academic world, staying very close to the open source and other communities, um, and embracing them when it makes sense, being flexible on our business model, and driving that technology forward. I always do worry that there's something else out there. But at the end of the day, what we do really well on the Vertica side is we have a phenomenal analytic database engine. And what we allow people to do is leverage this massive ecosystem that's been generated over the last three to four decades, tie directly into it, uh, but also it's a system that was designed for today and tomorrow's workloads. It's a it's much different architecture, completely built from the ground up. And that has given us a lot of flexibility to, to plug into things like Hadoop you know, with our storage APIs, to plug into various cloud platforms. We announced today uh, support for Azure from Microsoft. And I think that flexibility helps us as well. Even machine learning, you can plug in Spark. You can leverage a lot of these developments that are out there. But what we do really well is our execution engine, our optimizer, being able to let people ask any questions that they want against the data and serving it out in a fast, performant and efficient way, um, it turns out is, is, is pretty tough. You don't fit cleanly into the data warehousing box or into the big data Hadoop box. You're sort of somewhere in the middle. Is that a problem in market definition and in, in getting prospects to understand what you really do? Well, it's fun, it's a great question. And you know, if you look at our market, on the one hand you have you know, what I refer to as the high-end dinosaurs that had proprietary data warehouse appliances and charge a lot of money. I won't name who because we all know who. Um, on the other hand, you have things like Hadoop at, at, the, at the low, low end of the market, kind of promising to be able to do a lot of different things. And to your point, you're right, we're kind of right in the middle. And sometimes it's easier to say, I'm the high-end proprietary data warehouse or I'm the low, low-end disruptor. I think it was a little bit more challenging than it is right now. I think right now everybody's saying, wow, between those two things, there's a massive market and opportunity. And if you can deliver economics like Hadoop, but performance and features like some of the traditional experience you know, uh, platforms that have been out there that these customers are used to, sign us up. And now that message is resonating a lot better uh, but you're right, we, we are a little bit of in between because we have some of the best things in a database and some of the best things in these new platforms. And it's not as easy as saying we're either or, and sometimes that makes the messaging tougher. Well, I always liken the, the run on you know, the MPP sort of databases that all of a sudden there was an acquisition spree, like a, you know, when left tackles go in the NFL draft, everybody starts picking them up. Uh, and, and at, for a while, I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now you got this next big data wave coming, but you look at the big data wave and you say, wow, a lot of these companies are, are struggling. We've talked in the past about how it looks like the nose of the plane is up, but they're actually losing altitude, and when the funding dries up, it's going to get kind of ugly, and you're starting to see that today in some of the public companies and some of the private companies. Do you feel like there's going to be another a renaissance in this space that, you're, that Paul's describing in the, the, the middle space? I think that, uh, I mean, I, I think that there are a lot of companies in the capital markets the way they've been, especially private companies, there's been a lot of innovation funded. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that innovation 
people just believe that eventually they'll find the right business model and they'll make money and it'll all work. And in some cases that might be true, but I actually, you know, maybe it's my East Coast roots, I don't know. I, I think building sustainable business models is really important. I think it's becoming much more challenging for a lot of companies in this climate to show what's on the come. You know, they, you can't just survive on that alone. So I think everybody is being forced to some of the fundamentals that any good business has to show, and that is leading to some challenges. But I do think there will always be innovation. There will always be opportunity uh, for, for new entrants to come in. And I do think the focus very much now is on this middle area of how do we actually monetize this data? How do we actually do things with this data? Do you agree? I mean, I personally, I don't think it's unfair to say that the, the whole big data space was overfunded for the return that it provided, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? It's not a bad thing, and you know, I look back to maybe some of the other bubbles that we've had. Um, you know, no one would argue today that this internet bubble was was worth every bit that it was described. Eventually, it was understated. You know, at the it was time. probably understated. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, the markets may do this, but I think the fundamental phenomenon that's happening with data and information, I, I think it's extremely undervalued right now. As to certain vendors playing in the market and short-term gains, execution, yeah, we can all argue about that. But, uh, but I think fundamentally, the value of information and data uh, is very real. Well, one of the things we said early on and, and when you know, Hadoop started to explode was that it was the practitioners that were going to make the big dollars, right? Not necessarily you know, the next Microsoft coming out of this or the next Intel. And that was kind of the same with the internet. Yep. Right? It was the people who applied the internet to transform business models. You know, Amazon obviously is the poster child for that. Is that, I mean, do you, do you see, I mean, I suppose you could say the same thing with ERP. Right, if you could, if you could pick the companies who could apply ERP, you probably could have made a lot of money in the in the stock market back in the day. Are you seeing companies apply big data in a way that is really driving value that is consistent with what people expected? You know, on the vendor side, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I, there's no question. So I look at companies like Facebook and Uber and all these other companies that are that are at the end of the day, they're they're data companies, mm. um, and they are creating massive amounts of, of value. Uh, so I, I think that that same is true in, in many ways. The, the companies that are building on top of it can certainly capture value. But in there, if you're delivering value to them as, as an arms dealer, if you will, I think there's, there's plenty to be made there as well. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, this may seem like a simple question, but it's one I've found everyone seems to have a different answer for. How do you define big data? It's a great question, and I get this, it's, it's funny, I get it from, uh, particularly you know, since I'm with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, I get questions about all different types of technology uh, given our, our organization, but for me it's not necessarily about the size or the scale. I think when I think of big data, I think about bringing data sets together that in the past never were combined. Um, and they might be small data sets, they might be massive data sets. It could be a whole bunch of event detail data combining that with financial data or customer data. But the magic in it for me is when you start getting more and more people looking at that data when it's combined and generating insights. To me, at the end of the day, that's what big data represents. And, and one other funny story is we never talked about big data. In the, in the early days, even um, in the early days post our acquisition by Hewlett Packard, we never mentioned the words. And one day, I was presenting to a South Korean company and I didn't have the words big data in any of my slides. And I don't speak Korean, so we had a translator in the room and at the end of the presentation, uh, we asked if there were any questions. And I couldn't understand the Korean, but probably every 10th and 11th word was big data. <laughs> and I walked out of that and I had this epiphany and I basically said, you know what, it may be a confusing term, but it's certainly becoming a term that a lot of people are associating with projects. Some of these projects have been pent up over the last 30 years. Mm. People have wanted to understand things. And finally, you're giving it a brand and a name. And I think in many ways, Hadoop is very similar. It's become a brand and a battle cry. And so for me, I don't read too much into the big or the data, but it really represents this notion that there are so many things people are trying to do with information to better the world, and big data is giving them that battle cry and the ability to do it. And in some cases, companies now have big data budgets. 
So um, it represents, I think, a combination of mobility and the web and all these things coming together um, and, and the ability to analyze and move that much faster. So well, it's exciting. And, and you know, Gartner did a fine job in defining the, the three Vs. That was good. Yep, I mean, it was yep. well thought out, and it was, but it's a bit academic. Your definition that you just gave is a business outcome that was previously unattainable <laughs> with traditional technologies that all of a sudden this confluence of whether it's mobile and social and data and came together to, to achieve something that you couldn't achieve before. And that's what you're seeing now, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing. And it, it doesn't always, there are, there are a lot of projects that involve data where the desired outcome or what people thought they were going <laughs> to find was not true. But that is still a win. It's still a win to have learned that stuff. So we hear about a lot of projects where people analyze and do things and eradicate a cancer or you know, make billions of dollars or do this and that. There's a lot of other cases where they actually went through the data and they, they found maybe bad things, negative things. But being able to understand that that's the case is also a huge win. And that's a part of big data that I think isn't always talked about but it's a huge part of it. Um, you're still winning, you're still gaining value from that insight. And for people to pick up a project after somebody does that work and then take it further, this collaborative aspect of data and data science is also becoming a huge thing now. And I think the ability for us to share that information and move projects forward through collaboration is, is also unmatched. Well, the strategy's been right on because you didn't just dive into this open source, we'll figure out how to make money later trend. So that was smart. You didn't say, okay, we'll just try to lock everybody in with a proprietary stack. You said, all right, well, we've, we've got IP, we're going to keep it open, but we're going to add value because there's been a slow motion collapse in infrastructure pricing for a decade. Yep. But you've been able to, seemingly anyway, withstand that by adding value in, in unique ways. I think it's all, I think anything we do, it's, it's you know, uh, add value. Um, you've got to add value, and if you add value, then there's usually people that are willing to uh, reward you for that value, and, and I think we've stayed very focused on that, but we also look at the models. I mean, you mentioned this, being open, you don't have to be open source to be open and to be frictionless in your sales model and to make it easy for people to try it out and see what the technology can do. And so, you know, from the moment Andy Palmer and Mike Stonebreaker started the company, that openness, that culture was started and it, and it continues. And I think Hewlett Packard Enterprise has very much the same culture. It's a, it's a culture of innovation and engineering collaboration. So as long as we keep doing those things, then we'll keep creating value. And I think the world in this space needs a lot of value creation right now. So give us a rundown on the event. Had some great outside speakers this, this morning. Um, what's going on? What's up for you know tonight, tomorrow? Give yeah, so we got, we've, uh, it's action packed. It uh, obviously kicked off this morning with, uh, with the keynotes that we talked about. And then we go into breakout sessions. And these breakout sessions are either customer led or engineering team led. Uh, so they're very practical, they're very specific on, on the, the real issues that are going on. Uh, we've got a couple events in the evening, of course, by different geographic uh, locations, and part of what we set up is opportunity for our customers to be with each other, partners and customers basically talking and, and collaborating, and uh, you know, tomorrow we're going to do it again. Uh, Robert Youngjohn's going to be here, he's going to talk about uh, the Haven on Demand combinations announcement we made today. And uh, we're going to continue with a lot of the breakout sessions and covering both Idle, Haven On Demand, and Vertica. And uh, we'll end uh, midday on Thursday. So the weather looks great outside, and uh, it's a great time to be here in, in Boston on the waterfront. Yeah, we're in a sustained drought, so you're going to have some. You're going to have a good yeah, day for yeah, a little exactly. while here. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, one thing you, you talked about this morning is kind of unusual about this event is that it's engineering driven. The marketers can't drive any of the sessions. How do you sell that within the company? The company's been very supportive of it uh, from, from the beginning, and again, I think this gets back to Hewlett Packard Enterprise's engineering roots. Um, it's, it's just the straight talk on the technology, and we're very proud of that technology. We're very proud of people trying things, and um, we don't have to you know, pound our chests and, and make up all these things about what we do. We just show people this is what we do. And I think that fits great into the overall Hewlett Packard Enterprise, whether it's our hardware, our services, or our software, 
that's what we do. And so we didn't really have to convince anyone. I think everyone welcomed the opportunity. And, um, you know, of course, our marketing plays a, a very important role in, in everything that we do. But I think what's great about our marketing teams in general is they're just sharing the capabilities that we have in, in the products. And so it's a great opportunity for our engineers to, to talk and to, to share what they've done and open up and take questions and collaborate. So I think everybody welcomes that opportunity. All right, well, Colin, thanks for yeah. coming on theCUBE. Congratulations Thank you guys. on another yeah. good, yeah, good no, event. And, Thank uh, you. We'll see you around tonight and that tomorrow. That sounds great. Yeah, All looking right. forward to it. Thanks again. Excellent. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Paul and I will be back with our next guest right after this short break. This is theCUBE.